let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of studying. We ask in our presence as we study this our word in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, hello, hello. It's been a while. We are here at Community Baptist Church, 4821 Bobby Road. Holiness that behaves. It's been a while. We have moved since returning to uh, two Sundays of physical worship and four Sundays of vir virtual worship. We have moved our lesson to each fifth Sunday, and we're happy that you have tuned in to be with us. We pray that God's strength and mercies were with you this past week, and we thank God for the day that we're able to study together. Good to see you, and I Glad that I am seen as well. Let's get right into the lesson. The subject today is the resurrection of Jesus, how to share it. The resurrection of Jesus, how, how to share it. The text comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain and you are yet in your sins. The resurrection of Jesus how to share it. How do you share that Jesus rose from the dead? Can you prove that he did rise from the dead? Is that what witnessing is? Is that what witnessing means? A few questions concerning the subject. Let, let's look at how Jesus handled the way he was thought of while he was in the flesh. There are one or two, maybe three episodes in Jesus' life when he's betrayed by his, his questioners or those who were seeking uh, something more about him and how he was thought of in, while he was in the flesh. Let, let, let's see. Concerning Jesus being qualified or accepted as a scholar, over in John chapter 7, verses 15 through 17, you'll find these verses. Now, about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knows this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So the Jews questioned his qualifications as a, as a teacher, as a rabbi, as a scholar. Did Jesus exert his own knowledge of who he was or whom he had come to learn who he was? All Jesus did was, well, my doctrine is not mine. If you want to know whether my teaching or my conversation, my way of life, what I instruct other people to do. If you want to know if it be of God, then do it yourself. Do the doctrine. There's a whole lot of talk out here about whether or not Jesus lived, whether he's the son of God. Jesus faced that himself in John chapter 7, verses 15 through 17. He faced it as a teacher, as a scholar. He wasn't qualified uh, by the Pharisees, Sadducees, those educated people in the word, those custodians of the law. He wasn't qualified according to the dictates of the Sanhedrin or the synagogue. But Jesus said, well, if you want to know if, if what I'm doing and what I'm teaching, if you want to know if it's of God, then do the doctrine. Live it yourself. What I have taught, what I share, what I have told the multitude, if you want to know if it comes from God, then do what I have taught them. Pretty good. There's another instance, instance in, the, in, in, the, um, in the Gospels concerning Jesus and who he was to them. Found in John 10, verses 33, 37, 38. The Jews answered him saying, 
For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou being a man, you make yourself God. Jesus said to them, if I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And there's another episode, all in God's, John's gospel, all in John's gospel, chapter seven. He's not a scholar. Well, if I'm not a scholar, then what I'm teaching, you do that to see whether it comes from God or not. And he says in, cha in chapter 10 of John's gospel, well, you accusing me of blasphemy, well, if I do the works of the Father, believe me. And if you don't believe me, then the work that I do, believe the work's sake. Believe in me for the work's sake, if you can't believe in me. If I do not the works of my Father, don't believe in me, but if I... Do the works of my Father, though you don't believe in me, then believe the work that I do. You see how Jesus just threw off any notion that they had or that they came at him with in regards to his person. He never exalted himself. People didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. In his day, even, even in our days, they don't believe that he's the son of God. When John the Baptist sent messages to him, John asked the question, you asked Jesus, art thou he that you come, or do we look for someone else? You know that incident very well. John sent the messengers, Jesus sent the messengers back to John and said, tell John, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, the stammering tongue talks well, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. What did Jesus not do? Jesus didn't play the, the family card. He didn't play the family card. John, now, you and I first could. And your mother, mother is Elizabeth. My mother's Mary. They're cousins. You and I are first cousin, cousins. We're blood. You going to send messengers to your cousin questioning who I am? We're family. Jesus didn't play the family card. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus stuck with what God the Father had given him to do. In all three cases, when they questioned him about um, his teaching, his qualifications as a teacher, well, if you want to know if what I'm teaching is of God, do it. They accused him of blasphemy. He said, well, if I don't do the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though you don't believe me, then believe the work that I do. He pointed them to what God had given him to do. When his first cousin questioned him, what did he do? He sent the messengers back, tell my first cousin, tell my blood, tell my relative. The lame walk, the deaf hear, stammering tongue speaks, the blind see, the gospel is preached to the poor, the dead are raised. Never about his, his person. He, he, he never exalts himself you, you you can't you can't show that you are a christian following family you can't do that you, you can't show that you are a lover of god and that you serve the lord and that he's first in your life following family he that loves father mother sister brother lands money more than me is not worthy of me Jesus excuses all of those things. The lesson, the resurrection of Jesus, how do we share it? Well, we can't share it based on what Jesus does. 
and teaches in his word. Can't do it there. So how do we do it? There were plenty of eyewitnesses to the crucifixion of Jesus and plenty of eyewitnesses of Jesus after he rose from the dead. Plenty of them. Plenty of eyewitnesses. Let's see some of them. At the cross, there were Pharisees, priests, bystanders. There were soldiers, family members, some disciples, two thieves, Sadducees. At his burial, there were women, Joseph of Arimathea, and soldiers at the tomb. Those are a lot of eyewitnesses at the cross, a lot of eyewitnesses at his death, a lot of eyewitnesses at Calvary. Let's see those eyewitnesses after he rose from the dead. On resurrection day, the day he rose from the dead, he appeared five times. He appeared to Mary Magdalene in John 20, 11. He appeared to two other women, Matthew 28, verse 9. He appeared to Peter in Luke chapter 24, verse 34. He appeared to two men on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 13. He appeared to the 11 and some others in the upper room, John 20, 19. Five appearances on the day of his resurrection. One week later, when he appeared in the upper room in John 20, 19, eight days later, he returns because of Thomas. John 20, 24, he appeared to seven who saw him by the seashore. John 21, 1, he appeared to 11 on the mountain in Matthew 20, 28, 16, 20. He appeared, according to Paul, to 500 brethren at one time. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. He appeared to James, who saw him, according to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15 and 7. Then 40 days later, after he had risen from the dead, at his ascension on Mount Olive, he appeared to those who were there, Luke 24, 50, 53. And 27 years after his ascension, Paul writes in, in one of his letters, the greater part of the 500 that he appeared to a week later, were still alive. Plenty of eyewitnesses at his death. Plenty of eyewitnesses after he rose from the dead. But where an eyewitness would have been shown enough a joy, there's not a single one at the resurrection of Jesus when he got up from the dead in that sepulchre. In that tomb. Not a one. Eyewitnesses, whole bunch of them, while he died on Calvary. Eyewitnesses, after he rose from the dead, five on the first day, a week later, quite a few, 40 days later, quite a few, and even 27 years later, after he had risen from the dead, there were a greater part of 500 still talking about having seen him. But what about early Sunday morning? That is where most of the critics, the deniers, that's where most of the naysayers that's where they try to pull us in, those of us who believe, those of us who know for ourselves that he has risen from the dead. They want to not talk about Calvary. They want to not talk about the rest of the Gospels after he rose from the dead. They want to they wanna point their finger, zero in. They want to bring us down to that early Sunday morning when not an eyewitness could be found, written about, as evident that Jesus got up from the dead. That's where all the argument is. That's where we do the OJ. 
999 argument. 992 argue. That's, that, that, that's where that's where we argue all the time. How can we share our faith in the resurrection of Jesus when there is not one eyewitness that he got up from the dead? We can talk all around it, Calvary after, all around it, but when we go right dead in the center of it, we can't, we can't prove, we can't. Somebody placed a bet on social media. They wager ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars. If anybody could prove that Jesus got up from the dead, ten thousand. That person said, "I will give ten thousand dollars if you can prove that Jesus got up." From Well, let's look at those answers again. How do we share that Jesus rose from the dead? Can you prove that he did rise from the dead? Is that what witnessing is? Is that what it means? The answer is no. You can't. And no, that's not what witnessing means. No, that's not, that's not what witnessing is. Based on the nature of the evidence, at the sepulcher, not at the cross, not afterwards, not in the upper room, not at the seashore, not on the mountain, not afterwards, not on the road to Emmaus. None of those are evidences that he rose from the dead. We are at the sepulcher where they buried him. Based on the evidence at the sepulcher. What is that evidence? Let's look at it. Let's look at the evidences at the sepulchre where they laid him, where he was, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where they laid him. What is the evidence right there? You can't bring anything from the cross. You can't bring anything afterwards right there. What's the evidence? The evidence, number one, is that the disciples themselves, having not believed, did not go. That's evidence. The absence of the disciples at the tomb. Jesus told them five times in Matthew chapter 12, chapter 20, chapter 26, in Luke chapter 18, John chapter 2. Matthew 12, 20, 26, Luke 18, 2. Matt, Jesus told them five times, they're going to arrest me, they're going to try me, they're going to scourge me, they're going to crucify me, they're going to bury me, and on the third day, I shall rise again. He told them five times. And the fact that the disciples did not believe, nor did they show up at the tomb is evidence. That's the evidence. Right at the tomb. The absence of the disciples. There's some other evidence at the tomb. Soldiers were as dead men when the stone was removed. They acted like dead men. Something got a hold of them and they couldn't move. Didn't see stone. They were there, but when the stone was rolled away, they were as dead men. They got up and went to the Pharisees and the priests. And what did the elders do? The elders paid them to say they stole his body away. Now let's look at that untruth. It would have been quite kind of noisy for them to roll the stone away and take Jesus out. They had to get some chisels and some hammers and some horses and hoofs. Would 
have been noisy trying to get Jesus out of that sepulcher. Passover feast time, there were a lot of people in town at that time. It would have been crowded, crowded everywhere. You remember when uh, Mary was pregnant with Jesus, there was no room in the inn when they went. Feast of the Passover, everybody came. It had been hard for them to go through the town, find a secret passageway or path to get a dead body that should be in the ground out either day or night. I don't know if that would work. Let's see something else about that, that untruth. It was death to a soldier to sleep while on duty. That's why in John's gospel, the elder said, well, here's the money. Go and say they stole his body and we'll go to the, we'll go to Herod and secure you. You'll be all right. Hmm. That's, that's part of the evidence at the sepulchre. The other part is uh, if the priests believed that his body was stolen, they wouldn't pay people to tell an untruth about it. They would pay to have it brought back. Number one, the absence of the Pharisees is part of the evidence. Number two, this, this, this untruth that, that's paid for and, 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 and used to go out, I don't know. I don't know how much evidence you can use in that. That's just like a convicted felon used by the prosecution to testify. And they have a history of um, embellishment. I don't know if that'll work. To say it was stolen is to know that it was not there anyway. That's, um, I don't know about that number two. Maybe, maybe you can help me later on. I'll, I'll ask you about that one. So the evidence at the sepulcher, number one, the absence of the presence of the disciples, number two, the untruth that comes about as a result of the soldiers not being able to stay awake when it happened, according to the record. That's not much to you to try to prove to somebody that Jesus rose from the dead. But you know what? There's a third piece of evidence that's in the record that, you know, we don't, we don't teach much about. And, um, we need to preach more about. It's found in John's gospel, chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, following John, and went into the sepulchre and seized the linen clothes, Eli, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Well, you really can't make much out of that, can you? I mean, the linen clothes don't have a body in it anymore. The napkin that was wrapped about his head, it would have his blood, have his sweat, along with the clothes, they would be dirty. If somebody stole the body of Jesus, they wouldn't care much about the clothes because they were damp, dirty, bloody. Who would want to carry that? They would have torn those off of him, cast him aside. But the text says that the linen clothes lie. They were laid. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. That wrapped together meant that the linen clothes were also wrapped and laid, and the napkin was wrapped and laid by itself. That's a third piece of evidence at the sepulchre. Then, verse 8, 
Then went in the other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre. He saw and he believed. Now for the faith believer, those few verses that John writes there, along with the other evidences at the sepulchre, doesn't give us much evidence to use to try to convince someone that Jesus did rise from the dead. But that description that John wrote in his gospel, chapter 20, verse 6, 7, and 8, is not to be used to prove is to be used to those that believe because verse 8 says, then went in that other disciple who came at the first. He saw and he believed. So if you and I had the chance to go on that, that first day moment, and if we went into that separate and we saw the linen clothes wrapped over here, and the napkin wrapped over here, we would know that Jesus did rise from the dead because of the placement of the clothes and the napkin. It has a meaning. You know what it means? It means this. When the disciples saw the napkin laid, wrapped, and in its place, the person that wrapped it said to them, it was a wonderful relationship. I'm happy to have been with you and I look forward to seeing you again. That is what the napkin means. So it is not our witness to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. It is our thanksgiving that when we are convicted of our sin by the prayer of someone who prays for us, our salvation, and we come to a saving knowledge of his grace in the person of Jesus the Christ. When we read the Gospels as we grow in grace to the full man that Jesus wants to make us and will make us. When we read this portion of John's Gospel, John is telling us that when he went into that sepulchre, no, he was not there when he rose from the dead. No, he did not see him leave. But what he saw was his clothes wrapped in this place and the napkin wrapped by itself lying. And he said, he enjoyed it. It was a wonderful experience. And I look forward to seeing you again. So the nature of the evidence at the sepulchre is not eyewitness evidence like Calvary, or like after he rose from the dead. It's what is called in court circumstantial evidence. There's no means, motive, or opportunity. It's just circumstantial evidence. It's if you put all the pieces together, the only conclusion that you can come to is if you don't want to be cynical and deny, circumstantial evidence says, that we might not have seen him get up, but he did. So to the person that um, made the bet, $10,000 to prove that Jesus got up from the dead, that person's not stupid, no. Just foolish. To think that they can fool a believer. I leave the person right at the sepulchre where they are trying to pull us in 
to the circumstantial evidence so that they can have an argument. And all I have to say is this, as I close, you wager $10,000 for me to try to prove that Jesus got up from the dead. I put my $10,000 right beside yours because I know you can't prove that he did not get up from the dead. God bless you until next time. Holiness knows how to behave. And don't forget, holiness also votes. God bless you. Till next time. Thanks for being with us. Giving God's way. Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offering? Malachi 3 verse 8. Community Baptists and Friends. You may bring your tithes and offerings to the storehouse. Due to the COVID-19, Community Baptist Church will be open to receive your offerings each Tuesday from 12 o'clock p.m. to 1.30 p.m. You may also send your tithes and or offerings by mail. Please mail to Community Baptist Church or 821 Barbie Road, Durham, North Carolina, 27713. You may also give your tithes and offerings online. Please visit our website at cbcdurham.net backslash giving.